Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Speak to Customers to Build Trust. I'm Allie McDonald, Senior Editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's program is sponsored by Five9. Our speakers joining us today are Grant Packard, who is an Associate Professor at the Schulich School of Business at York University, Sarah G. Moore, who is an Associate Professor of Marketing, and the Eric Geddes Professor of Business at the Alberta School of Business, University of Alberta. And Brent McFerrin, who is the W.J. Van Dusen Associate Professor of Marketing at the Beattie School of Business at Simon Fraser University. Thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. So I will uh, leave it to Brent to kick us off. Thanks, Ali. On behalf of Grant and Sarah, thank you so much for having us. Also, a sincere thanks to all who are listening in live or watching the recording. We appreciate everyone sharing their time with us, and hopefully we can provide some insights around how to speak to consumers to build trust, especially during the current time where we're living in and trust has been shaken. And that's where we start. We're living in a low trust world. Uh, consumers are in a marketplace where they've lost trust in a variety of institutions. There's a couple of headlines here that you can see. Um, and just this week, The Atlantic ran a story entitled America's Having a Moral Convulsion, which I encourage you to check out as it talks about how levels of trust in institutions, politics, and even each other has taken a free fall. And the author traces how we've arrived at this point. For the historians out there, these periods of low trust do tend to wax and wane over time. But there's some concern about whether we rebound in the same way we have previously, just sort of given the changes in the media landscape over the past couple decades. Regardless, there's lots of data showing that people have a growing mistrust of government. This doesn't just stem from an increased polarization of politics. Citizens are reporting an increased distrust in other institutions, including Wall Street, the media, law enforcement, public health. And this is not an issue isolated to the US. None of the three of us live in America any longer. Uh, but I can assure you the various institutions have eroded uh, trust in, in much of the world as well. And some of this stems from the fact that consumers are increasingly interacting globally with brands and doing so over platforms and social media with a global reach. Uh, indeed, here you can see the Edelman Trust Barometer. That's actually about brands and, and companies are increasingly struggle to maintain consumer confidence on issues such as data collection, privacy, the usage of AI, their environmental practices. There's low trust in the media in part because of the ability to share things like this. This is the Starbucks Dreamer Day promotion, purportedly where the company was going to offer discounts to undocumented immigrants, which of course is fake, but nonetheless it makes its rounds and undermines both trust in the company and in the media it's shared on. We, and, and by that I mean consumers, are increasingly in some state between disappointment and anxiety uh, when it comes to trusting organizations. And all this was before the pandemic. Then comes COVID. Uh, and consumers face greater uncertainty and receive mixed signals regarding whether a brand really cares about them because they can't even get a human to talk to. If they do get through, consumers are arriving at interactions highly charged emotionally as they're dealing with uncertainty and frustration around things like refunds or product availability. The people they're talking to, many frontline workers, also have their own anxieties. There's changing directives from their supervisors, staffing cuts, shuttered branches, closed call centers. So lots of potential that things, for things to go wrong. If consumers actually do go and venture out, they're asked to limit their visits to physical stores. If they go out, they face a literally distanced service experience. They're questioned about their health, asked to line up and wear masks, shown where to walk, reminded to avoid other customers and employees. Firms are literally building walls between their employees and the customers they're serving. Although this gauntlet of control measures is well-intentioned, it can undermine consumer sense that companies are providing welcoming service when one goes to the happiest place on earth and they're greeted by a staff member who looks like Darth Vader. In times like these, simple cues of humanity matter more than ever, but they're harder to come by with organizations serving customers in new ways, either with distancing and masks or with phones and keystrokes, both parties in the interaction lose a lot of nuance from the more conventional interactions that we used to have. The usual reliance on things like facial expression, body language, even smiles, head nods, handshakes, all that stuff makes a connection with customers and it's not really lo lo longer available to, as it was before. So in this environment without the nonverbals, every spoken or typed word matters even more than ever as no longer can we use body language or a smile to compensate for poor word and language choice. So today we're gonna to highlight how using the right speaking terms can send signals that lead to increased trust and connection with your organization. Before we get to the data, we have a couple polls, I believe they're gonna come up here. 
Okay, so poll one, does your organization train frontline employees on how to speak to customers or clients? What we're seeing here is 61%, yes. Uh, uh, more organizations train than not, and, that's, and that's, that's more or less what I expected. For those who do not train, our experience is that some organizations just assume their staff know the right things to say from, from their experience as customers. All staff members are also customers, interact in the marketplace in various ways. Uh, and, and sort of assume that that their staff members will, will 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 speak the right way because they know what it's like to be a customer themselves. For those who do train, they either tend to follow some third party customer service manual or some internal guidelines or some mixture thereof. What we're going to present today isn't found in a book on customer service language, at least not yet, and actually contradicts uh, what's found in some of them because from our reading, some of what's in those books isn't actually based on rigorous science. There's a second poll coming up here. Or does the organization measure the words frontline employees use when speaking to customers or clients? Uh, so by this, we don't mean, do you record for quality assurance and training purposes? We're asking if you actually transcribe those conversations and run those conversations along with maybe email and chat through any software and, and measure anything. Oh, so now we're seeing fewer organizations doing this. In other words, while some record and maybe play back some exemplars as evidence of good or bad service, in our experience, few companies do much beyond this, including measuring the actual words and comparing frontline staff maybe against each other or against some target benchmarks. Our perspective is these things should be measured, and I'd add they can be easily measured using inexpensive software, linguistic inquiry and word count, or receptivity or two, uh, some of which you, you'll see later in the data that Grant and Sarah are gonna share with us in a few minutes. What we're gonna talk about today is a collection of science-based findings from our research on how consumers, or how companies, pardon me, can proactively make the most of speaking to their customers, whether that's in person, through voice over the phone, or in text-only email and chat. Specifically, we're gonna talk about three findings, First, that the firm can better establish through I instead of second, how to manage the trade off between speaking in a competent versus a caring manner when communicating to customers and clients. And finally, why concrete language can improve customer satisfaction. I'm going to pass it off to Sarah now to handle the first topic. All right. Thank you, Brent. Um, so, our first trust idea has to do with little words um, and so specifically pronouns like you, we, she, or I. So these words don't convey important concrete information like words such as product, sale, or refund, but they convey important information about the people involved in a customer service interaction. So pronouns signal the roles of the firm agent and the customer in an interaction. They indicate who's acting and who's receiving help. So customers use pronouns to make inferences about how much firm agents are feeling and acting on their behalf. So what pronouns do we see used in customer service interactions? Here's some examples from the slide. Your patience is greatly appreciated. We hope you'll fly with us again soon. So these statements probably sound very familiar to you, um, both as an employee and as a customer. And hopefully they don't sound too annoying or nostalgic, depending on whether you're flying or not flying these days. So you'll see on this slide, we've highlighted the first set of pronouns that are being used in these examples to give some idea of what gets used most often. So there's a lot of red on this slide. These are all the you pronouns that we've highlighted. On the next slide, you will see a whole bunch of we pronouns. So there's lots of we the firm and you the customer language going on. And that's not surprising. This pattern is very consistent with kind of a classic customer centric philosophy. Next slide. So to confirm this pattern, we did a quick empirical test. Um, we sent a bogus email pretending to be a customer to a random sample of the top 100 online retailers like Amazon and Home Depot. And we measured the pronouns that firm agents were using in their replies to us. <clears throat> so in the table, again, we see a lot of we and you pronoun use in almost every single email, but we see much less I pronoun use. I pronouns were present in less than half the replies from firm agents. So it seems like firm agents tend not to say I the agent. Instead, they say we the firm and you the customer. Next slide. But is this what they should be saying? Are these the right pronouns to use? When firm agents are talking about themselves as actors, should they say I or we? And when they're referring to the customer that they're helping as a recipient of action, should they bother saying you or should they leave it out? Does saying you matter? 
So in contrast to the pattern that we saw, um, and in, in contrast to kind of prevailing philosophies and the pattern that we saw in these bogus email replies, we argue that firms should say I instead of we, and that they don't actually need to say you at all. Why is this? When firm agents are using I pronouns, we predict this is going to increase customer attitudes, intentions, and purchase behaviors because saying I helps the firm agent signal that they're feeling and acting for the customer rather than we, the faceless firm. And we suggest that using you pronouns to refer to the customer isn't actually going to do much because it's already very clear in a customer service interaction who you is. It's the customer who asked for help. And in fact, using you might sometimes be harmful if it suggests that the firm agent is blaming the customer if they said something like, you entered your shipping address wrong. So we tested these uh, ideas in several experiments and using a large data set. I'm going to quickly show you one experiment and then show you the field data. So in this study, we used a scenario where participants read a reply from a firm agent. They imagine that they're a customer, their shipment's late, and then they read this reply from the firm agent. We had three different versions of the scenario, um, and all that varied between them was the pronouns. So in the first scenario, there were no pronouns. The agent said things like, the order is leaving the warehouse. In the second scenario, there were we pronouns. We found that the order is leaving the warehouse. And in the I condition, they said, I found the order is leaving the warehouse. So we got participants to read these, and then we measured um, how satisfied they were with the interaction, their purchase intentions, and we measured their perceptions of the firm agent's empathy and agency, how much the firm agent was feeling and acting on their behalf. So here are the results. You can see that the I pronoun scenario performed the best. So satisfaction and purchase intentions, that's this graph here, were the highest in this in the I scenario compared to the other two. And this was also true for agency and empathy. They were highest in the I scenario. So then we wanted to see if we could observe these results in the field. And also in the field data, we're going to test U pronouns. So we have a large data set of nearly 1,300 customer firm agent email interactions at a large online retailer. So in those emails, we measured customer pronoun use and firm agent pronoun use in terms of I's, use, and we's. We controlled for several other variables, emotionality, the type of complaint that it was, whether a refund was issued, and demographic factors for the customers. And we used these variables to predict customer purchases after the email interaction, up to six months later. So here are the results. They look a little scary, but we're going to walk through them box by box. Um, so the first box in yellow, these are the I pronoun results. So focus mostly on the second line here. Um, there's lots of asterisks, so that means there's lots of things going on with I pronoun use. So the second line, the I firm agent line, shows you that there is a positive effect. The more I pronouns that firm agents use in their emails, the higher sales are. This table shows you up to three months later, um, and the results persist up to six months later. So the more I pronouns firm agents are using in their emails, the more customers are buying subsequently. Next box is the U pronouns. You can see that for the firm agent U pronouns, there's nothing going on. So firm agents saying you, the customer, has no discernible effect on purchases you do see a negative impact of the customer using a lot of you pronouns. So if the customer uses a lot of yous in their emails, presumably you the firm, that has a negative impact. That might suggest they're quite angry. Um, the last box is the green box. This is the we model, and there's absolutely nothing going on. So again, much like you pronouns, when firm agents use you pronouns or we pronouns, this does not have a discernible effect on subsequent customer purchases. So this suggests that firm agents should use I rather than we pronouns, but what's the size of this effect? So based on the field data, we calculated that a 10% increase in I pronoun use could lead to an almost 1% increase in sales. Now, we recognize that it's true that not all the time can firm agents say I instead of we. So sometimes there might be firm policies or operations where they need to say we. 
but in most cases, it's possible to shift we to I. And if you shift even 50% of the we's in the customer service agent's language to I's, that can increase sales up to six and a half percent, just over six and a half percent. So what's the moral of the story? To wrap up this section, here's a summary table of what not to say. Don't say we, you don't need to say you. All your service agents need to say is I um, in terms of pronoun use. So the moral of the story is that little words matter, that I pronouns tell customers that the person speaking to them cares, and this has a significant impact on sales. And I'll pass it over to Grant. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to provide kind of a second topic here on how language can, can it really increase customer trust. And we describe this as speaking hot or cold. This is work uh, that we're doing with Yang Li at Chung Kong uh, Graduate School of Business in Beijing and Jonah Berger at the Wharton School in the US. Um, I find it interesting, perhaps you do too, that we sometimes call what frontline employees do customer service, and other times we call it customer care. Um, and those are really two different things. Care sounds kind of like empathizing, being emotionally supportive, while service sounds like just get, getting the job done, serving the customer efficiently, maybe rationally, and really being kind of competent. And interestingly enough, these two different ideas of, of care and service correspond to what psychologists um, kind of tell us are the two most important ways we evaluate other people. And that's warmth and competence. Those are the two things we kind of care about most when we're, we're thinking about somebody else. The interesting thing um, about these two things is that they're almost diametrically opposed. If we have a reason to believe or get signals that somebody is warm, that's kind of emotionally supportive, we think of them as less competent and even less rational. And inversely, if we, we get signals that somebody is kind of more competent, we see them as less warm. And this is known as kind of a, the warmth competence trade-off. The, the result of this in terms of what kind of psychologists say we should do and, and managerial researchers researchers say we should do is prioritize one of these things, that we can't be both, so we should either be warm or competent. And what prior work tells us is that we should prioritize warmth just in our interpersonal relationships and brands in terms of the kind of personality they want to exude should prioritize warmth over competence. But in the customer service context, prior research finds that competence matters more, that we really should serve more than we care at the end of the day. What we're doing in this, in this project that kind of helps us think about this better though is, is recognize that frontline conversations that we have with the customer aren't a, a kind of a, a one-shot momentary event, but they're like a voyage, right? There's a back and forth. Just like if we were crossing a lake, it may, may be that a conversation you know, is placid, and just as kind of stable as we, we cross that lake. It could be that there's a couple different phases where at one point we're feeling kind of cool and at a lower level, and then we cross that lock to the other side of the lake where things may be a bit more heated. But more likely is that, that there's all kinds of dynamic in the back and forth turns of conversation. and We need to account for when the, the peaks and troughs of that kind of interaction. So what we did in this, this work is we looked at the kind of conversational turns in conversation and looked at a conversation as, as essentially a time series. So we could think about rather than just being warm or just being competent, could it be that both matter, but just at different times? And so we transcribed over 19 hours of customer service conversations into these conversational turns. And then we have the end of call satisfaction measure that the firm takes and the before call and after call purchase volume over a 30 day period. We controlled for all kinds of alternatives um, from how the customer spoke to how the agent spoke to their synchrony, which is kind of like a mimicry to all kinds of different um, topics, uh, customer anger in the call to really try to make sure that we could say something relatively globally about speaking warmly or speaking competently. And if you're interested in the method, I can, can maybe describe it more in, in Q&A. The results are presented like this. So if you look at that, that zero center line, and we're looking over time of a call from zero in a time to one in a, 
one, which is kind of the percentage of the way through the, the call at the, the bottom of this figure here. Because we normalize call time, whether the call was two minutes or 15 minutes, we kind of standardize time. The red curve is the curve for affective language, warm language. If when the curve is above zero, that's a good thing in relation to satisfaction and purchase, um, purchase behavior. And when the red line is below zero, it's a, a bad thing. And so if we're talking about kind of warm language, words that have kind of affective and emotional content, you can think of this as just as relating to some extent, those have positive effects or are positively linked to the outcomes at the start and end of the call and negatively linked in the middle. So the way we can think about this, this is about rapport building. Um, this is about kind of initially establishing some humanity like Brent kind of spoke about earlier that's so important. Any kind of human dialogue we can have right now to make that warm connection before we jump into being a service agent, actually solving a problem. And we can see this when we, we now look at the confidence curve, where there's actually a penalty, a negative effect if we go right to problem solving. And many organizations I've spoken with say, we're about efficiency, customers want a solution. And we also need to manage call time or how much time an agent spends with any given customer if we're at a contact center or even in a store that's busy. We need to, to make sure we get to all of our clients. What this kind of research suggests is that no, first we need to spend a moment, and here it looks like about 10 to 15% of the interaction, kind of connecting to the customer in a more affective way before we get to the very important stage of actually kind of competently solving the problem. Um, that, that green kind of space is the only kind of significant region for competence. The other kind of farther down the blue line differences aren't significant. So you see overall this pattern, right? Where we need to be kind of affective and warm at start and end and competent and cognitive, more business oriented in the middle. Um, you might say, well, this is, this is how people behave naturally. That wasn't the case for this organization. Um, the red line in the left panel, panel A, we look at agent affective language, and the red line is kind of the ideal from our modeling approach, and the, the black line is what agents actually did with this firm, where we see that they actually speak um, affectively kind of throughout the middle when it's potentially the, the wrong thing to do. There's actually kind of a penalty in satisfaction and purchase for being warm the entire conversation. So it is the case that customers want us to get the business after that initial um, part of the conversation. If we look at the right panel and how agents tended to use cognitive language, the, the black line, they don't really focus as much on solving rational kind of agentic language uh, as much as they should in the first half of the call. They're relatively stable throughout the conversation in doing this. And I know organizations that do tend to prioritize one or the other. The organization this data is from really prioritizes a warmth kind of throughout the conversation. And it, and it looks like they, they overdo it. You need to be solving as well once you get past that initial rapport building stage. So if we kind of move beyond prevailing wisdom and say, okay, how much better off will the company that, that, that's able to train agents to remember they can be warm and competent but just at different times. We ran a series of simulations um, and I'll share the results of the simulation with you, but I'll urge caution in these results because what a, a simulation like this will do is assume we have perfect knowledge that agents know exactly the right time to switch and know exactly the level of warmth and level of competence they should deliver. When we make those assumptions, which again, aren't conservative, we see customer satisfaction for this firm increase by two and a half points on a seven point scale. And we see purchase volume increase by over three orders, which is a more than 60% increase in order volume. Again, I wanna stress this, this is due to the nature of the simulation, but it supports the idea that there's considerable upside if we could identify when to be warm and when to be competent. And I think the results here are relatively intuitive about how firms could go about doing that. Finally, just a couple implementation examples. You may ask, well, what is warm language and what is competent language? Well, warm lang language essentially uses words that you could imagine are linked to positivity or negativity. 
And at the start of the conversation, when we look at the underlying words that contribute to it, even using negative emotion words works because you can see a, a phrase like, oh no, that's awful. We're, we're using a negative emotion word to empathize with the customer. In the middle, competence words tend to be action verbs most commonly. They're, they're words that signal that you're thinking or you're doing something on behalf of the customer, right? We're taking action here. So the words that we speak that signal that personal action, and notice I've used first person singular pronouns here, just like Sarah described, can, can really signal that you're, you're, you're providing that service function. And again, it's important at the end of the conversation to do those simple things where we connect again in a, in a positive way this time with the customer. Finally, I'm gonna to move to a third example um, about how language can, can affect customer service outcome, and that's concreteness. We've all had the experience of going to retail stores where the employee says, you know, did you find everything you're, you're looking for today? And it kind of feels like they're going through the motions. They have to serve tens or hundreds of customers each day and, and it becomes routine to them. So they say routine things. What if the, the, the employee at the front desk of this guitar store said and said, did you find the guitar strings you were looking for? Or if they saw them looking at, at piano music, did you find the, the Elton John music you were looking for? The idea here is that if the agent uses more concrete words, which are words that are more vivid, more specific, more tangible, that the, the agent can sense that they're actually listening to them. So if you were at a restaurant and you ordered the tuna special, the grilled tuna, if the waiter said, that's a great choice, they're not necessarily signaling they listen as much if they say the fish is a great choice or that tuna is the great choice. It seems like they care more, they're paying more attention to you. So to give a couple other quick examples, um, if a customer at a fashion retailer was came out of the dressing room, the employee could say, that looks great. But if it was a top that the customer was trying on, that's even better because it's more concrete. Or if we concretely mention the specific item like the blouse. Similarly, we could do this with verbs rather than saying, I'll go get it. Just the word grab is more vivid. You can imagine someone's hands kind of grabbing something. It's more tangible, real, or even describing the specific item that you know the customer is interested in. Mentioning that could matter. So we tested this in a number of experiments and again using data from real firms, the language of agents at real firms. So an example of one of the experiments, we had, um, we asked participants to imagine they were at a store, found a t-shirt that they wanted, but couldn't find it in the, in the gray color that they wanted. And so what happens here is participants get one of six different replies from the salesperson. And these replies each increase in concreteness using either verbs, nouns, or adjectives. A participant would just see one of these and then they would rate the agent on how satisfied they were with them, how likely they would be to purchase, um, and whether the agent was listening. And here are the results. If you look from left to right at the bottom of this figure, we've got those responses of the agent from the least concrete on the left to the most concrete on the right. And what you see is in terms of listening, satisfaction, and willingness to purchase, all of these scores increase with these subtle changes and just being more concrete in referring to the customer's own interests. Essentially saying back to them what you can notice they're interested in. And the, the effects of satisfaction and purchase intention are driven by listening, by perceptions that the agent is paying attention and understanding. As I mentioned, we also looked at real data from two companies to kind of to, to assess whether this effect exists in the real world beyond just experiments, um, over a thousand interactions in both emails and call centers. We used a dictionary that's mentioned at the bottom of the slide here. It's free to access. It basically scores 80,000 words by how concrete they are. And then you analyze all of the language of your, your employee and say, is the extent to which they use concrete language linked to these important outcomes? And we found indeed, indeed it was for these two firms. A 30% increase in concreteness among agents corresponded to a nearly 10% increase in satisfaction and a close to 10% increase in purchases as well. And again, I caution the results won't be stable across industry and across firm, but we have strong evidence that concreteness can really help. 
Finally, just to give you a, a couple examples, again, of, of what we mean by concreteness, and I, I believe you can download the slides um, during or after today's webinar, um, you know, saying rather than those pants are a great choice, if you see the customer going for blue jeans, use the word blue jeans, because it shows that the, the, the agent is paying attention to the customer's own interest. And you can do this with verbs too. A mouthwateringly good pie is more vivid than just a pie that, that's good. So hopefully this has given you some, some interesting and potentially useful examples where in cases where you know, every interaction matters and it, it's harder and harder to kind of convey meaning face-to-face, -face, especially in, in the current kind of pandemic environment, that the specific words we use could really matter, whether that's personal pronouns, um, the extent to which the employee takes a more warm versus more competent kind of engagement and language style, or just speaking more concretely. Um, you can find out more about this research from the original kind of academic articles. If you're interested in methods or the specific uh, data sources, you can, can, can go out and find to, to see if you have these features in your own kind of service language. I'd also encourage you to visit the original article at, at MIT Sloan Management Review, um, where we talk about this research and other research that kind of helps us understand how to, to cultivate trust and confidence when we can't talk face to face and use those nonverbal cues as well. Uh, finally, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to myself or Sarah and Brent if you have questions that we aren't able to answer in the Q&A today. And with that, I will turn it over to Ali to start our uh, Q&A conversation. Great, thank you so much, Grant. Um, and we're gonna bring all the speakers onto camera right now so we can take some of your questions that have been coming in. And to our audience, um, continue to encourage you to ask any questions you have in the GoToWebinar questions module, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, just to start off, I would say, um, going back to the poll that Brent showed at the beginning of the presentation, it does it does seem like of the two questions, people, 60% of our audience um, are doing some form of training, but 30% are not. Um, so do you have tips or ideas for you know, how employees should be going about training and maybe for the um, folks in our audience that are doing training, areas of focus that are most important right now, especially in the context of what you all were pointing out to today of low trust. My opinion, especially in the present environment with training is we really want to stress empathy. So I think all three of these uh, and, and other research on language is really demonstrating that service isn't just about being efficient. And, and I know there's competing interests. We have to manage our costs, right, at a call center or in a retail environment of how much time we spend with each customer. But, but pronouns, listening through concreteness, warmth and competence, other work I've looked at on apologies and expressing appreciation show that really, if we can find all these different ways to stress the importance of, of being warm and, and building some initial rapport with the customer before you just go to, to solutions. Great, um, Sarah, Brent, any ideas or I can, I have other questions as well. All right. Um, so we also, in terms of measuring, that was the, the poll question where clearly um, fewer people in the audience feel like they're doing, they're measuring, um, you know, words, language that customers, customer service, customer service employees and frontline workers are using. So related, are there sort of practice, best practices there or tools even that um, allow companies to really track this easily? So we mentioned a couple um, in that initial talk there, the linguistic inquiry and word count, receptivity is another one. A uh, lot of this stuff, uh, again, if you download the deck, Grant had, Grant had another example later on. Effectively, these tools are, are all free or nearly free. There's a number of third party um, uh, companies that, that do things like sentiment analysis that in our experience, companies are probably more likely to be doing. Um, but to go to the uh, to, to measure the stuff that we are talking about today, it, it can also be done you know, internally. Uh, at, at a very low cost, um, and, and the tools are largely publicly available. 
Terrific. Um, to jump over to Sarah, so some of the results from your research that you were diving into, um, the use of I versus we, is, is, are you finding um, that that's influenced by language and culture um, with, that the experiment was applied to, or is, is there shifting between different types of contexts here? No doubt there is. So one of the, the critical conclusions that we came to is that part of our results are driven simply by the customer service context itself. It's a unique context. And it's a context where one person has already said, help, I'm stuck, I need a refund, my shipment's not here, I have a question about your website. So there are already very clear roles um, which helped us figure out which pronouns were best. And that's why those pronouns seem a little backwards. Um, and we compared in the paper um, pronoun use in customer service contexts to pronoun use in everyday life. Um, and most of the time, people across the world um, use lots of I pronouns, um, more often than not. That's kind of our default, which is not surprising. And so the default in customer service is the opposite because we're not speaking as ourselves, we're speaking as representatives of the firm. And so we say we as kind of the natural default, but it turns out that we should actually be talking the way we would if we were having a conversation to say I instead. And I think there probably are interesting cultural variations in pronoun use. We know that there are differences across cultures in how independent versus interdependent or socially connected people are. So that probably means there are main effects I think given the specificity of the customer service interaction context, um, that eyes on average are probably still going to be better. But you can imagine circumstances where a customer service agent saying we, first of all, is required. So if it's something that they can't do on their own, or if it's a policy that the firm has written. Um, but you can also imagine that sometimes if it's some major ask or maybe a negotiation between not customers and firms, but two firms that we, where the might of the firm and more people doing the thing is critical, then we might work better. So I think there are lots of interesting variations. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I definitely see that. And I think one thing that came up too for folks, and I, there were, just to give you some feedback, there were a lot of comments that seem people were like, oh, the I, that makes sense. I would, I would want to see this message more from someone. Um, so I think it, it resonated immediately with a lot of people in our audience. Um, one question, concern, does I create an impression that the agent is attending to the request based on more of their own personal point of view versus the firm, versus the, the values of the organization and, and how do companies think about training on that? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting perspective that comes out of the literature. So I pronouns traditionally have been considered markers of bad things, narcissism, Machiavellianism. So the more eyes you use, in theory, the more self-focused you are and the more the less you're paying attention to other people. But again, because of the context and depending on how you use the I, um, if you're using the I to speak as the subject, so I'm going to do this for you, I think this, or I think this top looks good on you, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. Again, you, you need to train people to be sensitive to when I versus we is possible. And maybe when, if the firm has particular philosophies or um, things they want to embody, like, I don't know, let's say you're a clothing company and you're sustainable, maybe you want people to use we when you're talking about themes like that, so that that gets connected to the company. So it's clear that you can use a balance. So it would be fair to train people to use I under certain circumstances where they're talking about specific concrete actions, and then maybe to use we when you're talking about things to do with the brand or overall firm policies or priorities. Mm -hmm. I could, and that gets back, I'm oh, sorry. Add to that, something I heard from one company that, that implemented this that I found interesting was they said, you could be either an agent, you know, you're, you're an agent, you could be an agent of the customer, or an agent of our, our company. And what they found worked was say, imagine that you're the agent of the customer, right? You're working for them. And that really helped, because it's hard to tell somebody to use more I pronouns. 
but when they told employees, you know, you work for the customer and, and really try to have that mindset, that helped them speak in more personal language. Because when they were the agent of the company, that's when they were more likely to say we, right? Because they felt like they were part of the company. And so that might be an yeah. interesting approach to, to, to implementing something like this. And I think this does, it continues to, to pull on this thread of empathy, which, you know, we're seeing pop up as a training point in lots of different parts of business. And I think, you know, in communication and the dipping in and dipping out of warm and cool, as Grant pointed out, it, it's, it really seems to intuitively make sense, but in some ways it's, it's easy to kind of lose sight of that. Um, so let me see, to, to maybe jump and shift gears a little bit in um, terms of questions, we have a very diverse audience here, um, different industries, different backgrounds. So in terms of application, um, is this something that folks who, who work in B2B or work in different types of businesses where it's, it's less customer oriented, but maybe the client is another organization, are there similar takeaways here? I'll take that quickly. Um, so I think that uh, what we were examining in, in, in a lot of this work was customers interacting with a firm. And when do they do that? It's usually when they have a question or a problem. Okay, That's a little bit different than an ongoing, say, sales relationship that you may have in a B2B context. I think that, um, and, and sort of my anecdotal experience, is that a lot of uh, people who have sales experience, they are already really good at building empathy. Right. They, they, they've already got that skill set of, of making that connection with the customer because they expect that it's going to be long and enduring. The challenge when you move to a more customer service focus is that uh, I'm contacting this this company as a consumer. And, and if I get, you know, Sally today, I may get John tomorrow. And how does uh, and, and the, the company is concerned with, well, how do I maintain that standardized service when the customer is actually looking for like, how do I get some relationship continuity? Um, how do I get the feeling that that person cares about me? So I think that when we're looking at more of these one-shot interactions, this is the case where these kinds of things matter even more because you have a shorter window of time to really build that connection. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and I think we had, we also had questions, <clears throat> excuse me, about industry here. Um, was, has most of your research been focused primarily in in retail and service? Um, do you is there anything else you think that that applies more on like, you know, we had questions about healthcare and in an instance where that's that's quite personal, that's that's quite eye oriented in many ways. Um, you know, what was the question here? Um, what, yeah, what are, are there ways in which agents can, can bring some of these insights into industries where there, there might be um, similarly very personal interactions and, and often quite emotionally driven, stressful ones too? I've had kind of experience beyond, so what we've talked about today has been mostly kind of retail kind of interactions. I've also uh, worked with airline data and we see, like you kind of mentioned, Allie, those are some of the most fraught, stressful interactions that, that consumers have with firms. And airline employees are particularly intimidated by, they, they know that there's a line in front of them you know, when you're talking about counter service. And so they're really motivated to, to be efficient when they can. And, and in that context, we found an even stronger kind of in terms of the importance of, of taking a moment to empathize um, in, as you, as you say, like emotionally difficult situations, which I mean, everybody is living, consumers and, and frontline employees and managers are living in a very stressful time. And so anything we can do in just about any kind of context to bring a little bit of humanity to the way we speak can, can really help. Great. Um, we also have to, to shift gears once again, the robots are coming. Um, we have plenty of questions about automated response and bots, AI attendance, and um, we've at SMR Ben, you know, we cover a lot of this um, using AI and customer service and the human and machine handoff. And so where that is happening today, 
how can firms better manage this handoff? And so are there even suggestions on, on how to incorporate some of this into what a bot or AI um, customer service agent might be, you know, saying to customers? I'll leave I it can, to I can anyone take a, who I wants can take to try that. <laughs> uh, I, I have a, a doctoral student, Claudia Iglesias, that's doing a lot of work on, on bots and AI and service interactions. And, and the thing that she finds is that, that bots and AI can work better in situations where efficiency and competency matters, but they really struggle in situations where we're talking about warmth and competence. And even when you can be quite sophisticated in, in the, the ability to deliver a potentially warm response. It seems that consumers still have this kind of uncanny valley reaction that a, a bot can't be emotional. And so firms that can stream calls based on, I know a couple firms that, and a couple software applications that can detect stress in somebody's voice in the first few words, and you can route calls based on whether it's a high stress or low stress customer that tells you whether that can go to a bot or that should go to a customer because it does seem that there are time when bots are better. When it's just about problem solving and efficiency, bots can absolutely be preferred to a human agent. But when it comes to emotion, we, we still need that human connection and we're, we're not there yet, it seems, on, on doing that with machines. Sure, and what does it say about the, the, the company's response to you if I'm being delivered to a bot, right? Like I'm, I'm excited, I, I'm, I'm angry perhaps, I want to talk to somebody and the company cares about me so much that they're handing me off to a machine. Okay, and so you can see the potential here um, to, to lose the empathetic reaction that, that we've, we've talked about today it is very high. Um, and, and, and potentially fraught with problems. And I think we're still quite a ways away from where a bot is able to, uh, as Grant mentioned, kind of deal with this in the same way a human can. And, and so caution definitely still um, in that regard. If consumers want a human, um, we, we, we kind of have to give them a human in a lot of cases um, because it can signal that, that, that maybe they don't, I don't value me enough, um, even if that's not the case, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, one thing that came up from from the questions quite a bit was was the formats and and different types of communication happening all the time. Um, and I think once again, people really seeing sort of the efficiency of of some of, of some of this switching um, in person on the phone. But how does some of this switching work in email or threaded conversations going back and forth? And is that an area where it isn't as efficient to combine the two warmer, um, you know, cooler or, you know, are there are there areas in which it's not going to make sense to employ the I format? So I think specific to the pronouns, those ones are relatively easy to move across formats. So the field data set we had there was email, and that's fairly asynchronous. There were kind of, I think the average was three emails or four back and forth. Um, but we also did uh, the same test on some phone call data and found the same pattern. You can imagine that, so it works for verbal and for typed. It would be easy to imagine how this could work on Twitter for customer service. It's pretty easy to use eyes and to sign the tweet that you're a, a specific person who's currently answering customer service issues. Um, so I think pronouns are easier to manage that way. Um, and I'll turn it over to Grant to talk about kind of the progression of warmth and competence in stretched out conversations. It's a, it's a good question. We, we looked at telephone, what we call synchronous conversations, live conversations. So we can't, we don't have good evidence about how that might work in an email conversation. But I, I would think even in a single email response to a customer or text response, particularly email where you've often got a, several sentences or a paragraph, that you don't want to just be purely functional in your response. You want to have an initial, for that first sentence that connects with empathy, which would seem to make intuitive sense. But again, I don't have evidence on that, that right now. And when it comes to kind of a, if we had a back and forth over email that could happen over several days, it's harder for me to imagine that it's, it's 
you know, probably in the start of that email conversation, it could be true. You need to build rapport in that initial email to have the conversation, the solving conversation happen over several days. But again, I don't have good evidence for that. Great. No, I think that's that's really helpful to touch on touch on both. Um, and one question that I think is really interesting um, and it's up to seeing if you, if you all kind of are looking into this or have any data for us, but um, does research point to the agents themselves feeling better after using this this kind of language? And and what does it mean for companies to help engagement of employees that are working in, in these types of fields? Um, you know, is there a benefit here for companies and retention or employee engagement in, in other ways? We didn't study that directly. I've seen other research that has studied studied that. And what, what I have seen is talked about how giving personal control and kind of autonomy to the to the frontline employee to make decisions is, is what really leads to employee satisfaction and employee retention. Um, but I, I haven't said it directly, but certainly there's evidence that that's the case. So, so the ex extent to which the firm can set up boundaries of if here's what you can or can't do within that space, you know, you have the power here to make customers happy. That's going to make for a happier employee. Mm -hmm. yeah, presumably the extent to which using these different forms of language, like using warmth and competence and concreteness and pronouns when you should, if that results in happier customers, and better interactions, then presumably your employees are also going to be happier, more satisfied. I think there's an interesting twist um, in the pronouns, which we have not done research on, um, where you can imagine that as, as agents get more personal control and use I pronouns more, they might, they're doing a better job of connecting with customers, but you might wonder what happens to the relationship with the firm if they're not expressing we, the firm, and I as a representative of the firm all the time, um, that might have some interesting implications for how connected they feel, but we haven't studied that. But I think it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. And to kind of toe back towards industry again, I think there's a consensus that this this is great and it's, it's nice to have the data to, to kind of look at and see the differences. But the reality, I think, is that we the we is hard to let go of, even as I'm thinking about yeah. it as, as yeah. you know, an editor and writer corresponding with people. Are there some industries where it's just it's not going to go away? It's not going to make sense, like government or certain places where it might not be the way in which to approach things. There are probably cases where you want to think that you have a team working for you and the team work is very important, I would think. And, and this is you know, speculation that that would matter when the team's small so that I can at least still imagine the team. So in a medical situation, I have a, I have a doctor and I have nurses and there's, there's you know, four or five people that are involved in my care that I, I might feel better about having we, right? Because I have four or five experts that are working to, to help you know, maintain my health. But when it's a, a big powerful entity, I, I don't think you know, if it's a corporation it's the firm, it's kind of the brand that it it becomes too distant and we doesn't really help. And I think that's probably true whether you're talking about, you know, a financial financial institution that kind of may, may not have a warm personality to, to begin with, or you're talking about like, let's say Zappos, which is renowned for providing very warm customer service, that it across the spectrum, we for a big company you know, isn't going to create the same connection that, that I is. I will make one other comment about we, and this might be particularly relevant for healthcare or for really emotional situations. The we that we have been talking about is a we that doesn't include the customer. So it's we, the firm, we're doing stuff for you in the background. You just sit here and wait and your shipment will arrive. But you can imagine in healthcare, if we becomes the whole team, and that includes the patient, that's gonna mean something different again, and probably a good thing. We're all in this together, and we're gonna work on it, and we're gonna help you. Great, thank you both. I think that gives us a lot to think about. And we have time for about one more question here. So I'm going to do 
the classic multi-pronged kind of <laughs> tentacled <laughs> question of, um, you know, we've we've had a lot of folks kind of wanting to address, well, there's omni-channel today and there's so many different places that we interact with customers. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, businesses, the way in which we interact, the way in which we buy from companies um, and come into contact with them is changing really rapidly. So in terms of how the research that you've looked at has developed kind of where it's gone, like from the past, and I know in different parts of the presentation, you've pointed out sort of like, this is kind of how we used to think about talking or interacting. This is what we're finding now. But do you see an acceleration, especially as we're talking about things like empathy towards changing? Do companies really need to be kind of finger on the pulse right now? Where, how should they kind of be following this? Um, okay, I can take a quick version of this. First of all, um, humans are humans and we speak to each other um, and, and want to be spoken to in a certain way that, that I think deviates less by medium than we think it does. So in other words, when we're, when we're speaking face to face, um, there's perhaps an intuition that we should speak differently when we're in text or writing. And, and, and what our research shows and what some other research has pointed to is um, that we probably overestimate the extent to which that's the case. And we still want to get that empathy. Right? We still want to feel that connection, even over these channels um, that, that are uh, maybe less empathetic inherently. And, and so I think that you know, my quick advice would be to, to think of how do, how do we speak normally, all right? And customer service language uh, is, is just inherently different. Um, and it's not that it should be different. I think that's the point Sarah made is that when we're speaking to consumers, we're speaking in a language that's different from regular English. And, and, and regardless of the channel we're on, we need to start thinking about how we can make those connections and speak as if we want to be spoken to regardless of the channel. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and I think this, I, I believe that these findings don't have to be limited to customer service, right? We communicate in different modes direct mail letters, right? They, they're usually signed by an individual. They, they have the same kind of implications here. A CEO's letter to, to shareholders um, or, or on, a, on an earnings call. Similarly, like whether they take kind of personal responsibility or how they shift from kind of understanding how the market's doing and rapport building before they kind of explain why it happened competently. These things should matter in many different modes of communication and many different types of communication. I, I, it doesn't necessarily need to be just service interactions. Thank you, I think that's a really great note to leave us with. And that concludes our time for today's Q&A session. Over the next few days, we'll be sending you a survey via email about this webinar and we greatly appreciate your feedback. I've enjoyed my time with you all today. I have, I'm already kind of incorporating some of my learning. So thank you to our audience for your engagement and your sharp questions. Thank you to our terrific speakers, Grant, Sarah, and Brent, and sincere thanks to our sponsor, Five9. Have a wonderful day, everyone.